Thank you, everyone, and good morning. And uh, we'll hear more from Barry as as we move forward over the next few weeks. He has uh, been inspired by a, a movement that he he has seen, and he'll be sharing more information with us. But right now, at this moment, we want to go back to Amos and uh, pick up our study of Amos there. Now, last week, I promised uh, my good friend Herb that I would fill in a chart for him, and I didn't get to it. So I want to do that right now. And there it is, Herb, numbers 9 and 10, are Jehovah Shalom and Jehovah Shema. So if you want to get out your chart and fill in those pieces, there they are for you. I wanted to tend to you immediately, first part of the class, so that you would have those. And uh, uh, what we did last week is we took a pause from Amos and looked at the names of God that Amos uses and other of the prophets use. And those names are, again, Jehovah, or the Tetragrammaton, and Adonai, and Elohim. And the first part that we looked at was that Jehovah actually has 10 different members. And when we look at the Hebrew meanings for those 10 names of Jehovah God, uh, Jehovah, Jehovah Sabaoth, Jehovah Rea, Jehovah Mekadishkim, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Shalom, and Jehovah Shema, we see the key attributes of God, that he is our creator, he is our captain and commander, our protector, he is the one who sanctifies, justifies, and redeems, he is our healer, he is our leader, he makes still and quiet, and he is the ever omnipresent authority. And that completes those 10 attributes of God. And then we also last week looked at Adonai and Elohim and the five elements of Elohim, El Elyon, El Shaddai, El Kwana, El Roy, and El Olam. And we looked at those names of God so we'd have a better uh, understanding of who he is. Now, I am going to take this and send this to you. You probably already have all this information in your notes, but I will send you a copy of the completed one. Uh, uh, sometime this week, you'll get it. Okay. Were there any questions about the names of God that we described and looked at last week? Does anyone have any comments? And Herb, I, I hope you've got your chart complete now with, uh, with those so. two. All right. Thank you, John. You're very welcome, sir. And thank you for being interested in these little side trails that I take us on. I think they're sometimes as important as the main lesson. <laughs> All right. Well, anyone? When, Go ahead, sir. I was just going to say when when a single uh, verse of scripture uses uh, Yahweh and uh, you know Rafa and Jira in the same sentence, we ought to know who he's talking about. Yes. And I think yeah. this really helps, John. And in Helps Amos, me. this is the sentence here in Amos 6, 8. The Lord Adonai, God Jehovah, hath sworn a binding oath by himself, the living being, saith the Lord Jehovah, the God El Ohim of hosts. I abhor the excellency, pride, and arrogance of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore, will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. That was the passage in Amos that triggered this study of the names of God. Okay, no, so good. that takes us full circle from what we did last week. Uh, we also summarized at the end of the lesson, Amos 6, and we looked at the danger of materialism. And I just want to present to you this summary one more quick time, and then we'll move on to the new material today. What we learned in Amos 6, and you can uh, you can put some of this down on Amos handout 38. At the bottom of Amos handout 38, if you haven't filled it out, this is the, uh, uh, the part that we're going to look at very quickly now, again from last week. Amos teaches us about the danger of false security, that when we place our confidence and security in our material luxury and our means, we're going to fail. 
And when we do that and we focus and worship the things of the world rather than the one who created the world, then punishment for that sin is coming. And in verses 1 through 7 in Amos 6, we learned about these financially successful people who forgot about God in their ease and luxurious living. And Amos came as a warning to tell them that their pride and their arrogance and their sensuality would be their downfall because they had forgotten God and became vainly confident in their accumulated resources. And they thought that their wealth and their technology could deliver them from the conflicts and the sin that they were in. And many of these people considered themselves to be people of God. Uh, those who were in Israel, those who were in Judah, those who were in America today. Uh, if, if you asked some of these leaders, are you a Christian? They would say, yes, they believe they're the people of God, but they're indulging in sin every day, and they're conforming to the worldview and accepting abortion and accepting homosexuality and accepting uh, altering the body and rejecting the discipline and direction of God. And they're refusing to acknowledge God. And Amos came to proclaim that their actions were really proclaiming what their faith was. And it's interesting, on uh, Tuesdays, the Bodhis are leading a study of James, and that, that's a very good study that recognizes this same concept, that our actions betray what we're faithful to. And uh, you can see James for much more of that. But those who's, who are set upon their own pleasures and ignore the needs of others and they claim faith, but they have no deeds that back that up, that are consistent with what God calls us to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't just love God. And those who place their happiness in their wealth and worldly pleasures, quickly approaching them, approaching Israel is Assyria, approaching Judah is Babylon. Uh, last week, I showed you that China isn't approaching America that's already here, and we're already seeing the assimilation process going on in America right now that was written by a Chinese warlord hundreds of years ago. And they're still following that plan today to conquer America from within. And Amos is telling them that God is chastising us to try to bring us back to the path. And if we don't respond to that chastisement, then there will be a day of accountability and punishment will follow. And God has sworn that he will hold us accountable. And unless we sincerely worship God and don't offer a false religion that proclaims faith, but doesn't have works that sustains the faith, then our services to God, our religious practices, when they're soured with our sin, they're bitter and they're not sweet and God will reject that. And that's the message Amos brings to Israel, the message Amos brings to Judah, the message Amos is bringing to America today. So I guess, Barry, there's the proclamation right there for that study that you were talking about a few minutes ago. There, there's, there's the sheet in front of you right there about how I, Amos is trying to set us back on the path. Okay, any questions about that summary of Amos chapter 6? Okay, Amos chapter 7. We always start by looking at the entire chapter and then breaking it down into its pieces so that we can uh, digest it a section at a time. So this is the 17 verses of Amos chapter 7, and we're going to read through it in its entirety now. And as we do that, we're going to break it down into manageable sections that we can take one at a time and study together as we move forward. So uh, let's go ahead. And if you will go to Amos handout 42, Amos handout 42 on the bottom, you will have the uh, beginning of chapter 7. And on Amos 43, you'll have the rest of it. So as we go through this, you can be circling and underlining as you wish and uh, using that handout number 42 and 43 as we go through this section of dividing Amos 7 
into digestible pieces. Anyone have any questions before we begin? Okay. Amos chapter 7. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers, locusts, in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowing. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O Lord, forgive, I beseech thee. Okay, so let me stop here for a minute. So we had an action of the Lord here. He sent a host, he sent an army, a physical army, not an army of a nation, but an army of nature, an army of locusts. And that army of locusts did not come to punish. They came to chastise. Now remember the difference between the two words. Chastisement is when God acts in our lives and he brings disaster to set us back on the proper path. Punishment comes after the chastisement fails. And the chastisement doesn't get the appropriate response. When that happens, then it's time for God to hold us accountable for the sin we continue to do, even though he's already showed us the ill of our ways through chastisement. So God sent the locusts as chastisement. And then in verse 2, it says that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O God, forgive, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. Now look at verse 3. This is really interesting. The Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep, and did eat up a part. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small. Again, the Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord. So here's the first section, and this is a fascinating section. Because it's telling us that the Lord God showed Amos a vision. And in that vision, he showed Amos what was to come. First a chastisement, and then a punishment. And Amos responded and said, God, Jacob is a little guy. Stop. Don't punish him any further. Forgive him. Show mercy. Okay, he's little, and the Lord responded by repenting and saying, it shall not be. Okay, I will change what I had planned, and the Lord says it won't happen. So how would we title this section? I've titled it, Amos Pleads with God for Mercy for Jacob. So in this first section of chapter 7, we're going to learn some interesting things. We're going to learn about God and how God repents, because the repentance we see from God is not the same repentance we see from man. They're very different. And we're going to recognize what it means for man to repent and what it means for God to repent and how those look. And that'll be a really interesting subject. And Amos here is intervening as a prophet and pleading for forgiveness and for mercy for Jacob. So that's the first six verses that we'll study together. John? Go ahead. This is Collins. Uh, looking at the interlinear Bible that yes, you encourage us to, uh, uh, the word, the, the Hebrew word is translated, uh, uh, is pronounced Neham, and it's translated in the King James as not repented, but relented. That's correct. I know, that, I know that's a, a very small uh, letter change, but uh, the P to the L or the L to the P, I believe makes a significant difference in our understanding of what uh, the scripture says. A and, massive difference. You're right. And we're going to so see that as we go through those six verses, 
And we look at repentance and relent, and there's another word that I'll hold until we get there that describes God and 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 how he responds to the pleas of Amos. Very good point. Yes, repent and relent are very different. Correct. Good comment. All right. Anyone else? So that's where we're going as we move forward to the detailed study. I'm just framing the entire chapter right now. All right, so let's continue verse 7. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hands. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord, behold, said, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them or over them anymore. So again, God shows to Amos a vision. And it's a vision of a plumb line. So we're going to study what is a plumb line? What is it for? When was it used back then? We don't use it that much this way now, but we're going to study a plumb line and we're going to recognize what that means. And so I'm going to title these two verses, the plumb line of God. And that's going to be an interesting lesson as well. When we look at what is God doing, he's a surveyor and he's surveying something and he's setting something true to a plumb line. And we're going to study that in verses 7 and 8. Verse 9. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, notice he doesn't call him prophet, he calls him seer, Go, flee thee away into the land of Judah and eat their bread and prophecy there, but prophecy not again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and it is the king's court and not God's, but the king's. So now we have this introduction of this man, Amaziah, the priest, and how he stands up in opposition to Amos, the man of God. So we have two prophets. One is claiming to be a prophet, and he's not. One really didn't want to be a prophet, and he is. And the contrast is, is amazing in these verses. And so we're going to set this section apart, verses 9 through 13, and we're going to look at Amaziah and Amos in conflict. And then I'm going to ask you, who today in America may Amos be, and who may Amaziah represent? And we're going to look at those two characters and the conflict between them and tie them into America today and see who are the Amaziahs and who are the Amoses today in our world. And we're going to look at that when we look at verses 9 through 13. So three very interesting lessons. The first one will be Amos pleading with God for mercy. The second one will be the plumb line of God. And the third will be Amaziah and Amos in conflict. The next section, verse 14. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. The Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophecy unto my people Israel. Now therefore, Hear thou, Amaziah, the word of the Lord. Thou sayest prophecy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus saith the Lord, 
thy wife shall be a harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land be divided by line, plumb line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. So this is the response we see from Amos to Amaziah, where Amos tells us who he is, who he was, and that he's not doing this of his own will and device. He's obeying God. And this section is going to teach us about when the world tells us to do one thing and God tells us to do another, what should we be doing? And we're going to look at that and learn who is Amos the prophet and how are we to respond knowing who he is. So the, this is the, the outlook over the next few weeks of what we're going to be studying in Amos chapter 7. And I, I hope you can sense already how incredibly exciting this chapter is. We're going to learn four very incredible lessons. Pleading with God for mercy. The plumb line of God and what that means. Amaziah and God in conflict. False prophets and true prophets. And then the fourth lesson is, who is Amos and what do we learn when God tells us to do something and the world tells us to do something else? That's what's in front of us in this wonderful, exciting chapter. I got goosebumps just telling you what I'm going to teach you in chapter 7. Does anyone have any questions or comments about where we're about to go? Just a statement, John. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. I asked. As you start chapter 7, I think God is talking about Jacob, not Israel. Correct. Then he draws a plumb line and he separates Israel. And it looks like from about 8 on, he's really talking about Israel and not Judah. Is that correct? That is a reasonable interpretation. I don't know if it's correct, but it certainly is a way that you can look at it and go with it. Or you can continue to apply it to both Israel and Judah and in the latter days, America as well. But I think if you if you want to limit it only to Israel, then that that is a legitimate approach. Uh, I don't I'm, I'm not willing to say that's correct or incorrect, but it's possible and legitimate for you to do that. Okay. Well, what I'm saying is, I, I think he's going to chastise Jacob, which includes Judah, and he's going to punish Israel. Okay. So that's why that's why I looked at this like one of the chastisement, and I think Judah gets out with chastisement, even though they go to, to Babylon. I understand that, but they, then they come back. Yep. Israel never comes back. Right. That's correct. Yep. Okay, very good. And then the question for us today, looking back through the time of history and looking at where we are today as we approach the latter days, are we in chastisement now or are we in punishment? Right. And that's an interesting question. Okay, all right, very, very good. Okay, so now in an old handout, and I don't know which one I emailed to you, uh, Amos 44, handout 44, on some of them it said this was Amos 8, 1 through 6. You need to correct that if your copy says that. This is Amos 7, 1 through 6. So if yours doesn't say Amos chapter 7 and it says Amos chapter 8, cross out the 8 and write in the 7. I sent out a couple versions. I'm not sure what version you have. Okay. So now let's take this first piece, these first six verses, and let's put the Hebrew words in and the Hebrew meaning and see if it increases. Well, we know it's going to increase our understanding, but let's see what additional understanding it gives us as we go through this. Okay. Now we studied the names of God, Jehovah, Adonai, and El Ohim for a reason. And this is the reason. Because we see here in chapter 7, these words being used. And I want you to know which ones are being used because it's, it's important to understand that. Thus hath the Lord. The word here for Lord is the word Adonai. The word here for God is Jehovah. So here we're seeing two of those names of God being used. Thus hath the Lord Adonai, God Jehovah, 
showed, and a show means he appeared in a vision to Amos. Now, Amos, there's nothing in the book of Amos that says anything about dreams. So I'm going to assume that all of these revelations to Amos by God were through visions rather than through dreams, because he showed or appeared to him. And behold, he formed, he created grasshoppers. Now, the word here for grasshoppers are swarming locusts. It's the locusts that swarm and totally strip all the green vegetation off. Okay. And that is an army. And the word for army is hosts. And the Lord Adonai, God Jehovah, is Elohim, the God of hosts, the God of armies. And here's one of his armies, the locusts coming. Okay. And when the day breaks is when they arrive. They arrive in the morning as the spring crop comes up. So the spring crop is coming up and all these tender green shoots and there's a darkening on the horizon. Oh boy, here come the locusts just in time to devour those wonderful, wonderful, tender spring growths that the people need to live on, to eat. Okay. So at the breaking of day, as the latter growth springs up, now, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Now, this is interesting. So the king does its first mowing and takes the best. He takes the first fruits. And the people are left with what's behind that. Okay? So the king has been allowed to have his mowing, and then God sends the locusts. It's interesting. Okay? Verse 2, and it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating, of devouring the grass of the land, the green prairie, not the planted crops. Now, they not only ate the latter growth, but they also ate the grass of the land. So they spread out from the planted crops, and there were some natural grasses too. And when the people, when their crops would fail, have a blight or something, they would go and eat the natural grasses. Well, notice that these locusts have taken that out too. So they've not only eaten the spring crop that was deliberately planted to feed man, but they've also taken up the backup. They've taken out plan B. The prairie grasses are gone as well. And that's something a lot of people don't get. So what, what is coming According to what we've read so far, terrible, terrible famine. Okay? The crops have been devastated, and now the prairie grasses, plan B, the natural grasses, they're taken out too. Okay? And Amos now makes a plea and says, O oh Lord Adonai, God Jehovah, forgive. So he is seeing this as punishment. And he's asking God to forgive. What does forgive mean? Give up on you the better, punishment. You better know what this word means, because if you ain't got it, you're in deep trouble. Mercy. Mercy. Give up on the, give up on the punishment. Just yeah. what it says. Give the punishment. Get, do away give with up the punishment, punishment, Lord. Okay. Okay. It means to pardon a debt. Okay. I'll to forgive that. is to pardon the debt. When they sinned, they owed wages. The wages of sin is death. Death is going to come by famine. And Amos is saying, Lord, back this off. Forgive. Pardon the debt. Don't do this. Okay? I beseech thee. What does beseech mean? Beg. Beg. It's to pray. Okay? To pray for intercession. Intercede, Lord. Intercede. So Amos is showing the people that it's God who has the power to deliver them. It's not Moloch. It's not their idols. It's not their technology. It's not their fertilizers. It's not their scarecrows. It's not what they do. It's Adonai, Lord, Jehovah, God, Elohim, God of armies. He is the one 
to pray for intercession to because he is the one who can pardon your debt. The wages of sin is debt. In a sense, Amos is preaching to them the gospel and demonstrating to them that the one they need to return to, the one they need to acknowledge and recognize, is none other than Adonai, God the Son, Elohim, God the Spirit, and Jehovah, God the Father, Creator. And the argument Amos makes is, shall Jacob stand up for he's little, he's lesser, he's the least. He's helpless. And in verse 3, we get an amazing word. The Lord repented or relented or changed his mind for this. Okay? The Lord changed his mind and said, It shall not be, saith the Lord. The famine will not come. Then the Lord showed into his eyes, and behold, the Lord proclaimed a fire, okay, a conflagration. It not only destroyed the crops, but it also destroyed the locusts, okay? So he changed his mind, and he destroyed that host and took them out. And it devoured into the abyss and consumed a portion, not everything. So this is what happens to the locusts. God intervenes, takes them out with fire. And then I said, O Lord God, cease, leave it alone. I pray to you. Okay. So what is Amos teaching the people about what they should do when they're being chastised and punished by God, what should they do? What did he do? He beseeched. What is that? Interceded. Prayed. Four letters. P-R-A-Y. You got it. Amos is teaching the people, and he's teaching us, if we're wise enough to see it in these verses, that when we face the chastisement, and we face the judgment, we need to pray to God and beseech him and pray for forgiveness and pray for mercy. That's the example Amos sets. By doing it, he doesn't tell them to pray. He prays and shows them and demonstrates it. Okay? So I think that's really, really important that we recognize the demonstration of the power of prayer. Okay, and he says, "Who can who can stand against J Jacob? Is small. He's nothing. He can't stand against you." And again, the Lord relented and withdrew, and said, "This shall not be," saith the Lord. So we need to understand what does this mean when the Scripture says God repented. Now, the, most of you have had this handout for a while. So you know this question is here. Did you, did you study it? Did you answer this question? What does it mean when Scripture says God repented? I know one of you looked it up and said the word is relented, not repented. So let's study this word and let's recognize what it means when the Bible says the Lord repented. And is this unusual? Is this only in Amos? Or do no. we see this elsewhere? It's everywhere in Scripture, okay? In Amos 7, it means to change one's mind and alter a planned action or withdraw from a course of action that's already going on after further consideration. God was already in progress of administering this justice. So in this case, in Amos 7, he had planned an action, he was executing the action, and he withdrew it. And that's what repented means in this context in Amos 7. 
<laughs> now, other examples. Hand raised. I'm sorry, what was that comment, Annette? Collins has his hand raised. You want All right, Collins, go ahead. Before we go too far, uh, the you have it up on your screen about uh, praying, and you use the word for intercession, and you mentioned intercessory prayer. Isn't intercessory prayer something a little different than praying for oneself? Oh, yeah. Isn't intercessory prayer praying for another or a, a group, another a group? It's praying for God to intervene both for others and for yourself. It's inclusive, I believe. Thank you. You, okay. you know what's come to my mind, and, and, and I'm sure it has to Barry Haindell because I've heard him uh, quote it so many times, is Second Chronicles 714. You know, if my yes. people will humble themselves and pray, and it's not just a, a prayer that we normally would say, hey, Lord, here I am, let's talk. It's like, uh, Lord, this nation is going to hell in a handbasket. Can you help us out? That That's better. Okay. I think this leads right there. Okay. Well, we're going to look at several scriptures now. And hopefully you read these scriptures. That's why I sent you the handouts earlier. So you could do that. You read Jeremiah 26, 13. Let's see what that says. It says this. Look at the top of your screen. Now, I'm showing you the amplified version. Therefore, now change your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and reverse his decision concerning the misfortune which he has pronounced against you. Okay, He's withdrawing the punishment and backing it off in Jeremiah 26. Look at 1 Chronicles 21.15. I'm going to put it up here next. God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying it, as he was administering God's plan, the Lord looked and relented concerning the catastrophe and said to the destroying angel, that's enough. Remove your hand of judgment. He backed it off. Okay. So God can change his mind and show mercy anytime he wants to. How wonderful that is. Okay. And Joel 2.13, if you remember back to Joel, says, Rip your heart to pieces in sorrow and contrition, and not your garments. Return in repentance to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, faithful to his covenant with his people. And he relents his sentence of evil when his people genuinely repent. God responds to his people. Is there hope? Yes. The fact that God repents and relents gives us hope that even when he is administering his plan, he can withdraw it and back it off, and he can tell that angel, enough, stop, remove your hand of judgment, no more. God can do that. The only one. Very important scriptures hey, teaching John. us a very important quality of God. Go ahead. Hey, John, isn't that what happens in salvation? We're headed to hell until we repent, and God bestows salvation upon us yes as long as we don't think of repentance as a work and we recognize that repentance is where we actually acknowledge god and yeah. respect his covenant and then he will relent his sentence when his people genuinely repent so the word here, repentance, is very, very important for us to understand what it means in reference to God. All right, let's look at some more scriptures. It's expressing regret over an action in the past. And I've given you some other scriptures here. Let's look at Genesis 6.6. 6. 
and I'm going to put it up here in blue, the Lord regretted that he had made mankind on the earth, and he was deeply grieved in his heart. So he looked at what he had done, and he regretted it. That's another word for repenting, is regretting as well. And 1 Samuel 15, 11 says, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from following me and has not carried out my commands. Samuel was angry over Saul's failure, and he cried out to the Lord all night. And Jeremiah 18 says, if that nation against which I've spoken turns from its evil, I will relent and reverse my decision concerning the devastation that I intended to do. Do you see the hope in these verses? Please see the hope. God reserves his power of mercy to do that anytime he wants to. Thank God we have a merciful God. Do you also see beyond the relenting of God or the repentance of God, uh, the fact that it kind of depends on the free will of man. Uh, God gives uh, truly a free will. It, it, the one particular I think of is Saul. God appointed Saul, and you think God knows the end from the beginning, and he does. But yet, he lets history take its place, continue, and then when he does indeed make the wrong choice, God changes his mind or relents or repents or regrets and moves on. It's interesting because we know God knows the end from the beginning. Well, so it's hard to put in context sometimes. When man repents, he turns away from sin. When God repents, he turns toward mercy. Let me say that again, because this is really important. When man repents, he turns away from sin. When God repents, he turns toward mercy. Repenting brings hope that God will act under mercy before his action of justice is delivered or completed. With man, repentance is turning away from sin back to God. But with God, repentance is changing his mind about future action or an action in progress, and usually result in an act of mercy. Very interesting. Collins has his hand raised, John. Okay, Collins, go ahead. Uh, John, uh, I appreciate your teaching us about the meaning of repent and relent. Uh, the Hebrew word that we translate as repentance is Teshuva, and it's a, and Teshuva is a lot more than a feeling of guilt or regret. It in fact derives from the verb to return. I have an appreciation for repentance, as I've shared with you before, in a military term as a to the rear march. The sinner is marching away from God, and at the point of repentance, doesn't stop, doesn't do an about face, but does stops about faces and returns and marches back to God. I have some difficulty. Uh, pasting onto God the quality of repentance that I have come to understand being more a uh, necessary for mankind. Now it's uh, you know it's a mystery to me all of God's uh, qualities and maybe one that you are. Uh, peeling back the curtain on is that God was uh, walking away from God's mercy and at the point of man's repentance, God stops and turns and returns back to God's loving ways. 
But well, I, I think what we're seeing like, here no. is we're seeing the interaction between two attributes of God, the attribute of justice, an eye for an eye, and the attribute of mercy, of forgiving the punishment that a person is due. And and God, we, we can't even comprehend how God manages to juggle those two together, but he does it godly. And we can't comprehend that. But I think what we're seeing here is the tension between mercy and justice, because justice and mercy are very, very different. And justice begins God's action. And fortunately for us, our God, Jehovah God, Elohim Adonai, it doesn't stop at justice, but he can repent or relent and pull the mercy card whenever he wants to. Right. No, that's, we... that's the appreciation we have to have for our God. Okay, there's a couple points I want to make before we end the lesson today. So let me go on, please, and get those points in because we're running short on time. Okay. Okay. So let me just read these words about what Amos introduces, and then I'll stop, and then we can get back to this if we need to discuss it more. So we've just learned about God and repentance is different than man and repentance. That again, with man, repentance is turning away from sin back to God, and with God, repentance is changing his mind and resulting in an act of mercy rather than justice. So in verse 7 through 9, Amos gives us this information. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So it's very important to recognize that the response God is going to do is he's going to draw a line in the sand with a plumb line, and he's going to make a sharp separation. And that's what I wanted to introduce that thought. That's what God is going to do when he pulls his mercy in over that line. Okay, so did anyone else have any of the comments before we plug in the rest of the Hebrew here? And then we'll have to end for the day. All right, let's put the rest of the Hebrew in. What is a plumb line? What is it? It's uh, a line with a bob on the end that is centered so that your walls can be straight in both th all directions. That's okay. exactly what it was. So it defines what is straight. Can I right. condense your words that way? Is that okay? That's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. So a plumb line defines what is straight, a vertical line, sharp and exact. Okay. Now God has the plumb line in his hand. Notice that. Okay. The Lord stood on the wall. The Lord is the one who's controlling the plumb line. Okay, and he says he's going to put in place a plumb line in the midst of my people. What does in the midst of mean? In the middle. In the middle. Really? Does it mean that? Or is that what you think it means? This is really interesting. It actually means the inward parts. This is really critical. Because I always thought what you thought, and you answered it the way I answered it when I first thought about it, that the, in the midst of my people means among them. It doesn't mean that at all. It means inside their inner parts. Remember, God said, I'm going to take my law, and no longer is it going to be on tablets of stone, but I'm going to inscribe it on their hearts, their inward parts. Same word here. Jeremiah inward Ezekiel. parts. Yep. OK. So God is going to give us a gyroscope inside of us. The plumb line, ladies and gentlemen, is the Holy Spirit. 
who allows us to see true and see the sin. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay, boy, I wish I had a half an hour more, but I don't. I'm going to have to stop there. We'll pick up next week with the plumb line, what the plumb line is, what the plumb line is for, and what it represents. And we're going to learn about that plumb line and recognize that God has given the plumb line to those who believe in him and acknowledge him. We have the Holy Spirit within us to guide us, to sanctify us. There's the plumb line. Did any of you ever think the plumb line before was the Spirit of God? I think you see it now. Yep. How interesting. Okay. It's 8.30. I'm so sorry, but I have to stop because we're out of time. Does anyone have any closing word or closing questions? Dave, sometimes these hours just aren't long enough, you know? We need to I make them you. longer. <laughs> <laughs> anyone with any other questions or comments? The word is just wow. Wow. I'm That's sorry? All I can say. Wow. wow. W O W. Yeah. Okay. Anyone That's... have any final word? The plumb line is controlled by gravity. Gravity is gets its connection to grave. Grave is something where bodies go after death. And this is something that is was created by God in the beginning, the law of gravity, which is what controls the line. Let me show you what a plumb line looks like. There's a plumb line on the right, okay? Identifying straight. Okay, Dave Bodie, would you close our time right now with prayer, please, so that we can uh, let people who need to go, go on. Sure. Lord Father, thank you for, again, this day. And as I mentioned before, the absolute privilege and honor of being able to study your word with all the men and women that's here that gives us an exchange of idea. We sharpen one another. We become better in your word. Uh, I just can't express the thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us this privilege and opportunity to learn your word. Thank you for blessing us with John and the amount of effort. I know what it takes to put the effort in to come and bring this to our knowledge. It's a lot of work. Thank you, John. And thank all of you who are on this, this study and each and every one of you that participate. Uh, it means so much to all of us to get everybody's uh, discernment of what's happening. So again, I can't, I'm just lost for words because I'm just blown away by the honor I feel for being present here today. I just pray these things that you continue to look over each one of us throughout the week, throughout our nation, throughout our leadership, and uh, throughout the world, Lord. Uh, pray these things in the name of your precious Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.